Uh, thank you so much, and thank you so much for this extraordinarily kind and really moving uh, introduction to me. I, it's hugely appreciated. And I really want to thank the DAD. Um, I'm here remote because my flight got cancelled this morning, and the fact that the, the DAD could just switch very uh, quickly to this hybrid format is just just wonderful. So it's really lovely to be here uh, with you uh, virtually. I was going to introduce the speakers myself, but you've already done this. Um, so what I would just want to highlight is that all of our speakers um, have a phenomenal combination of both um, a pedagogical um, expertise. So they are all really experts in pedagogy in various ways. Um, but they also bring with them a real experience in thinking through how you then translate this pedagogical expertise, not only into their own classroom, but also in, an in, in a wider institutional and a wider transnational setting. So I'm really delighted to have this wonderful panel uh, with us. And this is a panel that is not just a random collection of outstanding experts, but they have really worked together um, within uh, the, the Guild um, and um, really on thinking through how we can um, develop new concepts of um, higher education in the post-digital age. They've, they've um, uh, been together developing this work since uh, 2020. Uh, and then uh, what we've seen as a result is in 2021, I can plug this here, um, is an inside paper on reimagining research-led education in the dig digital age. And they've really led a whole series of uh, reflections, discussions, debates uh, over the past uh, year, uh, which I hope some of you will have will have uh, been part of uh, and, and will have joined. Um, but um, Whilst those discussions have been going on, they've continued their, their thinking, they've continued their research together. And today we're really fortunate, I think, to hear some of the first fruits of this ongoing research about how we can really rethink and reframe um, mobility. Um, but Joe, I mean, maybe if I can start with you, I mean, I guess the first question that we really need to ask is kind of why we need, why we're thinking about, or why we need to rethink mobility now. What's the urgency? What is what is the the kind of reason for 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 um, us really talking about this in new ways or trying to imagine mobility in new ways, Joe? Yes, uh, for the live stream, you're right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, okay, so uh, yes, thank you, Jan. The uh, mobility is certainly not new in higher education and is definitely very well established in Europe. Uh, we have the Bologna legacy, the a very important tradition from Erasmus Plus uh, and various tools that, uh, that have been introduced over the years really to uh, encourage and enhance uh, the possibility of uh, mobility and transnational collaboration. What is different now uh, is the current context, the global circumstances circumstances that we're experiencing. We're coming out, we hope, we're at the tail end of the 2019 pandemic that actually took away uh, one of the core ingredients of mobility, which was travel. And uh, in a sense, it has been accelerant in a number of different ways uh, to actually get us to think uh, more the online, uh, offline divide, uh, but also to really think of mobility uh, in a more diverse way. And that's something that we knew we need. We know that uh, Erasmus, particularly in the study abroad format, uh, has, has and is uh, very uh, impactful uh, for most of us who participate, but uh, large numbers of students cannot participate, so we need to diversify. Uh, at the same time, the geopolitical changes uh, also present very significant challenges in thinking around uh, mobility and collaboration, and that's also very important important part uh, of uh, thinking of the sort of the strategy and urging us to really think differently. Uh, and in that context, the policymakers, both uh, international and national policymakers, actively encourage higher education really to deepen collaboration, to remove obstacles to mobility and to increase uh, the ability to provide joint, uh, jo joint uh, curricula in different formats. The target and the aspiration is very ambitious uh, for mobility as we know it. Targets uh, are uh, anything from 20% to every other student to participate. Uh, the current Erasmus figures I haven't uh, 
the check the very, very latest, but last time was something like 3.734, something like this. So the difference between 3.73 and 20 uh, is really significant. But apart from that, it's actually really uh, the sort of thinking in the context of mobility being associated with deepening attractiveness, competitiveness and resilience for Europe uh, is to actually uh, take this moment where we have a lot of attention from policymakers uh, on the transformational potential of education and really think uh, and move our sort of framing of mobility as a single thing that happens here or there or in sort of one particular stage to really think mobilities uh, in the plural. And that is very much the sort of what we have uh, in the context, the opportunity we have in the context of the European University Alliances, uh, which really uh, provides a space to think how we can work together differently so we can become more than the sum of parts. Uh, and if we are to really join efforts, how we can actually really uh, really find a way to collaborate and we know that transnational educational collaboration is not easy uh, but equally instead of thinking in the same ways of the past to really think how we can actually use the opportunities we have now to think differently or to use tools we have uh, to think differently to meet the aspiration uh, and the targets and the opportunities we have. So um, I think it's ver very topical and very timely uh, and an opportunity that we should not miss to talk about what we're talking about today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. So, so um, Joe, um, uh, Barry, can I maybe ask you to come in on this and, and maybe, so, so there's clearly a huge moment here to, to um, think about um, a step change in bringing about more mobility. Um, but there are also sort of countervailing tendencies, it seems to me, um, um, and I wonder if you agree. So, so if we look at um, news from the UK right now, the the Prime Minister's uh, Rishi Sunak is is uh, reported to consider in, imposing a ban on um, or, or an upper cap on international student numbers. Um, in the Netherlands, the Dutch Parliament has just passed a resolution to um, also with a, with a view to to limiting the number of international students uh, coming into the Netherlands. And whilst these are full time uh, uh, students and not we, we're not really talking about um, temporary mobility, there is clearly, it seems to me, a, a uh, also a, a kind of um, shift as part of this geopolitical um, apart from the, as part of those geopolitical trends that uh, Joe mentioned, um, to go against mobility or get to go against internationalization, how does that? I mean, how does that chime with you? I mean, is, is this something that you recognise, and what, what do you make of that? Yes, I certainly recognise uh, this, uh, and I think, as Joe said, we we are talking about how do we move a step forward. And I can say that I'm not very proud, but I can say that we have in Denmark taken a step backwards um, just shortly uh, in uh, Denmark uh, we have a very generous uh, educational system you don't just get free education you also get a stipend of 850 euro per month for you for studying and uh, you can almost imagine that this has been very attractive for students from the EU. So costs to, to, to uh, international students have gone way up. It has been tried in, at the European law and said, well, if students work at least 10 hours per week, they, are, uh, they can get uh, the stipend. So uh, since you can't look at the passport, the, the only way to, to limit the cost has been to reduce and put a cap on, on uh, the number of uh, students that was done in 2021. 20, uh, uh, and so although it is, it, it's again, even last week, it was confirmed that there is a good business case in having international students, since only one third of the students stay on two years after graduation. Uh, we had a, a, a heavy cap on, on the number of international students, also the number of educational programs in, in English. Uh, so, so I definitely recognize and, and, and already know how <laughs> what it means. On the other hand, which is really interesting, is that uh, I'm sure you, from all your countries, too, experience a lack of skilled workers, uh, especially within uh, engineering, uh, IT, 
So now we have a heavy pushback from industry who says, well, it's difficult to attract uh, these people, so maybe you should have... Uh, Still, we, we should take off the cap. Uh, this is also very much, uh, it's, it's not just a matter of economy, it's also ideological, uh, nationalistic parties don't, even there is a good business case, they, they are not in favor of, of paying for, for international students. So sad to say we were front movers on this, uh, uh, but, but uh, it's sad to hear that other countries follow. Yes, and as yes, exactly. So, so you're no longer alone, but clearly this is something we need to think about. And so, um, Karen, maybe maybe can I turn to you? So we clearly need to think about mobility in in more complex ways. Can you maybe take us through some of the the concepts of mobility? So, wh wh why is it that we need mobility from from your perspective? What what are the key arguments? And and so, what can we also then say to it for, for, uh, through pedagogy, but also to policymakers about why we need this? Much, Jan, and let me say uh, we are all very sorry that you cannot be here because you're the one who brought us together, and that's <laughs> the first time that we actually meet uh, physically. Uh, we just met online before, so it's a great experience for us to be here. Um, yes, thank you very much for your question. I think there is like two big strands. One could be called uh, an issue of positioning, and the other one an issue of orientation. So in terms of positioning, this is very much an economic uh, argument saying that, um, um, that international student mobility is important because of human capital development, because of finding your niche, developing your skills uh, to compete in a global labor market. And at the same time, that same argument can also be used for the institutions uh, that universities are also competing internationally for the most talented uh, students uh, to draw uh, the best heads, as it were, uh, to come to the universities in order to gain a competitive uh, edge. And all of this, of course, has to do uh, with globalization, with the global knowledge economy, which is borderless, basically, and uh, which uh, sees itself as kind of moving freely um, in, um, in the globe. So, um, from that point of view, for many universities, uh, investing in international student mobility is viewed as uh, just that, a profitable investment, uh, which is kind of the reverse of what's the case in Denmark, right? In Denmark, students receive a stipend, and uh, in the UK, for example, uh, students have to pay quite high fees in order to study uh, at UK, in UK universities. Uh, the other approach, uh, the, not the positioning uh, approach, but more the orientation approach, is kind of a critical, a humanist, a more classical uh, concept um, related to the German uh, idea of Bildung, uh, which means education is basically a human right. It has to do with developing your capacities, with, having, with being exposed uh, to other cultures and uh, learning about the world, being in interaction uh, with other people and with other approaches to knowledge. And so in that regard, universities are seen as places of connectivity where critiques and uh, where critical and imagination is developed and, uh, um, and this is taking place in unfamiliar settings. So it's an interactive kind of a position. And uh, this orientation view is often seen in opposition to the instrumentalist view, but maybe it does not necessarily have to be so. And uh, I will at this point maybe not talk about uh, the proposition by Lowe and others about the capabilities approach, but just let me say that this is an attempt to merge kind of what uh, the latest trends in university development are and relate that back to the original idea of the university. And let me maybe at this point stress that because sometimes when we talk about mobility, we might lose sight of what is the core mission of the universities. And 
you might know that there is a huge debate about this, and especially in the German-speaking world, and in France too, the unconditional university debate started by uh, Jacques Derrida and others is continuing. And uh, these uh, scholars emphasize the core of the university is not research and teaching in the sense that we um, view it now, because there are many other institutions who do research and there are other institutions that do teaching. The core of the university is to provide a public space for open debates where kind of new knowledge is explored, where new answers are sought in a free exchange between student and professors. Now, this is a very idealistic view, no question about it, but it still is important, I think, to ask how can we integrate that into our ideas of mobility, which are very often, you know, very brief, very uh, um, small scaled, especially when we talk about uh, micro, um, the micro level. Uh, Karen, can, can I ask maybe you or, or anybody else from the panel a supplementary question on, on this point? Because I, I was um, attending a, um, the presentation by the Austrian Minister of, of uh, Science yesterday here in Brussels of, the, of an Austrian initiative right now to strength, to really strengthen the nexus between uh, scientific education and democratic education, where, where the idea is really that universities are a, a, a really crucial space. To strengthen, um, to strengthen society, to strengthen liberal democracy, debate in a liberal democracy, um, acknowledging a really strong nexus between scientific understanding and democratic capability. Is that is is that relevant to that discussion? You think? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I would, I would think this is the core, you know, we can no longer, we cannot go back to the medieval idea of the university, that's no question. We cannot even go back to the nationalistic idea of the university, which was, you know, building in order to provide orientation for, so, for the societal progress of one nation. So we're also beyond that. Now, the real challenge is, you know, how to combine um, university education, which is mass education, and that is good that we are open now, much more open, much less elitist than we were a few decades ago, but how to bring that in with, you know, a uh, human rights, a liberal democracy uh, perspective. Can I just uh, add uh, one second on that uh, from the work that we're doing as part of our ongoing work? Uh, and uh, we've analyzed uh, the sort of all policy around uh, mobility and around uh, the sort of current call, uh, and also um, had the opportunity to have conversations with colleagues from uh, the Guild. And it's actually very important uh, if we actually see who is a typical mobile student, how, how the typical mobile student is framed on the back of what you just said now, Karen. And those are typically students who come from high income backgrounds. Mm -hmm. uh, there are students who come from backgrounds that are not specifically categorized as vulnerable, disadvantaged or underrepresented. And there are students whose parents already have a higher education degree. This is already from analyzing the policy and from Looking into the experience uh, of some of our colleagues, I'm sure they will echo uh, uh, the kind of tr what this translates to, which is that uh, also adding the high living costs in Europe plus lack of European financial support means that opportunities are possible for, for self-funded students from uh, different parts of the world uh, who are, they can apply to do our degrees or joint degrees and so on, which very much echoes the high income background. Uh, the issues around visa and so on and everything that comes with what Barrett was saying really also play a very important role about what are the opportunities and, and what is the sort of, uh, how does this relate to the role of our universities. Um, in order to overcome a number of obstacles that we all know, programs that allow for mobility are selective. So uh, they take away what we often see as part of our role, which is to allow time and space for and, and facilitate and guide our students to make connections. So uh, this is taken away. Uh, and then students from own institutions where those opportunities are offered are, the, are not the ones that can afford the programs themselves. So in a sense, there are various zones uh, within Europe which we knew, but we actually also have those resilient patterns of destination and, and sending and receiving and so on. So thinking of 
who we are, what, as you were saying, okay, what is our role? What's, what we mean by opportunity? How we associate those with mobility? Mm -hmm. How it is related? And who we are offering opportunity to? And it's great that we do that, but how, how if we are really serious uh, about equality, if we're really serious about inclusion, uh, participation, social mobility, and so on, given that we already work with a population that has made it to universities, so we are already not touching the complexity that we would have had if we had this conversation for earlier stages. How can we actually really open up? Because what we see is that we are kind of creating more and more of a pyramid. Uh, and that is really fundamental. I, Joe, that's a, just a perfect segue. I don't even need to ask the question because you've asked it to uh, Auna. Do you, do you, I mean, do you have a, some, some pointers to us? How, how do we open up? How do we respond? To yeah, these challenges. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Jan. Um, uh, we will come with the solutions. We promise that we will uh, maybe have the feeling during this discussion that everything is very in the very bad situation, but we promise that by the end of the discussion we, we, we show some light. <laughs> but before that, <laughs> I just wanted to, to make a very quick journey to, I mean, through the, I would say, last five years of uh, very came from and where we are now and how is all this mobility is related to the digitalization because that's the topic of the conference also. So if we took like five years ago, we had three, let's say, separate tools in the university. We had the tool for mobility and the mobility, at least in our case, and I think in most cases was counted only if you were in another country, in another university, you got 15 credit points there and you brought them back to your university. That was counted as a mobility. Then we had another tool that is, of course, more than five years old, but we had the, the, the joint curricula. And the joint curricula, uh, the aim was that you finally get the joint degree or at least double degree from different universities. And there are a special group of students participating in joint curricula, so studying in different universities. And they were not the mobile students, they were the joint curricula students. And then we had, of course, uh, initiative for supporting e-learning or web-based learning that was in order to support our local students or to uh, to to provide lifelong learning to the to the people working and these two strands or two activity or three activities didn't sort of too much merge to each other with the four things or three things happening in between the european commission is the aim of aiming 50 percent of students to be mobile within the university alliances with the COVID in between and with the fact that uh, we have this aim to be sustainable, to, to survive in, in 50 years time. So all these changes during the last five years have brought us here today that we are thinking, I mean, how to put these three tools together and to create new ways of mobilities and to how to count it and what does it mean and whether what are the aims then if we if we say in our university alliance network but is in light uh, including currently nine universities we are talking about the stepping stone in each curricula so you would start with the that is also could be called a mobility that uh, international, I mean, somebody from another university as teacher would come and give you a lecture. So that would be called a first step on the mobility. Then you would have a virtual course in another university, studying still physically in your own university, but taking a course virtually provided by another university. And then maybe you go to the uh, third step, that is a blended intensive program, where you have the virtual course, plus one week mobility, physical mobility in another university. And then maybe some of the students also go to the fourth step, which is a semester or a, or a few, few months in another university. And so th that's the kind of, um, practical situation and then where we are struggling with that what what is the benefit and what kind of a mission this kind of mobilities would uh, would uh, serve so um, i know maybe it's the the field of opportunities or it's the field of uh, <laughs> problems mm. it's just the mm. way how you if you look at that <laughs> But that, but that's really fascinating because, in a sense, it seems to me, Anna, what you're what you're arguing for is is that we that we also really need to think much more about a deeper integration into our own educational model um, of, of of mobility. Uh, and and I, I, Barrett, can I can I just um, ask you to come in on that in, in terms of how you think about this 
this integration in terms of um, the, the whole student journey, in terms of the key things that you 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 need to look out for as as you are in a sense in, in charge of of uh, or, or leading on the academic development of Aarhus University. And, and maybe like I want to also point to to the university alliances. We are also in a, an alliance called Circle U, including Humboldt University here. And and one thing I think we have seen is that the teachers are more prominent now in in collaboration, also through uh, the guild. Uh, and and maybe we can. S I see an opportunity in in that we don't see mobility as only on the shoulders and of the students, but also that something where teachers engage more. We are talking more about embedded uh, mo mobility. Um, and, and of course, part of it could be a lecture by a, a, a professor from another university, but maybe also deeper in, into to educational programs. I see promises there uh, also that, that we, go through the teachers to, to, to engage uh, students and that mobility should not be on the individualized, privileged, as, as you said, uh, Joe, uh, student, uh, but, but that we uh, use the enormous uh, capacity that teachers who, who engage, which also could uh, benefit uh, research collaboration on the long run. Um, can I actually ask um, other colleagues to really, I mean, um, uh, Joe or, or Karen, also from you to, 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 to maybe reflect on back on your networks, um, uh, Karen, I think you're, you're engaged in Civis and, and Joe in, in Utopia. Do you have any, any examples of kind of how you're beginning to rethink mobility in very concrete terms through these Euro European University alliances? Yeah, with regards to Civis, I mean, the, the name is kind of programmatic, it has to do with civic engagement. Uh, so one of our main targets uh, in mobility is indeed, you know, to um, have students or have students come e either virtually or face to face uh, to either be engaged in service learning projects or, you know, in other formats that do engage uh, the civic society, the civil society. and. Um, this also relates to the to the research part because in the guild and also in the university alliances, you know, we're talking about research strong universities. Uh, so in Civis we have uh, several hubs uh, that uh, address relevant issues like climate or health or uh, societal issues and link that uh, to the design of the mobilities. I think, you know, and maybe this is taking it a little bit uh, a step too soon because it's a point we're coming to, but I guess we need to explore that uh, uh, deeper is no matter what the design of the mobility is, I think uh, we it, it should link to previous experiences. I mean, I, I, Jan, you know that I'm uh, very much a fan of uh, John Dewey, and I still think that he was very right when he said, uh, that you know, it's it, that experience has to build on each other. There has to be a continuity, and there has to be a extensive and intensive growth, uh, which relates both to the subject matter, to the content we teach, uh, but also you know to the social uh, and emotional experiences the students have. And I think we have to have all of these dimensions in mind and then think, you know, how does that particular program link to other activities which the students had, to other situations they were in, so that there is, you know, this, the, these two principles of continuity and interaction both have to be present, no matter whether it's physical mobility or virtual mobility or blended. I think and, and in uh, that sense, sorry, just before uh, Joe, I mean, in that sense, you're also really um, already beginning to think about the, the whole question of scalability, right? So, so, so how can we make sure that this experience of mobility is not just for the, for the, you know, for those who are involved in the European universities, but actually for the entire institution, etc. Uh, I, I guess, and and also for institutions that are not necessarily in European universities. Sorry, Joe. 
Yeah, no, that follows uh, very much. It's, so in uh, Utopia, uh, what uh, we are, the educational model we're taking uh, is uh, to establish connected learning communities. Uh, so what, what we did in uh, Utopia 2050, which was the pilot, which uh, we completed yesterday. So officially on the 1st of December, we started the Utopia More. Uh, and for Utopia 50, what we did was to not uh, go towards the route of establishing uh, new um, joint provision in the form of joint degrees uh, or um, sort of full joint curricula, but to uh, enhance and enrich existing good practice. So we had we established a process by which uh, learning units, credit bearing, existing provision of uh, BA, M, postgraduate or PhD level Level, would provide uh, the, the, the spiel, the seed for connecting uh, colleagues. And this is where very much speaks to Barry's uh, point of really the need to create communities because we know uh, that we often overlook the very critical relationship between teacher and student. And we know that uh, inspired teachers make inspired students and uh, create opportunities in different ways. So uh, through learning units, we established uh, learning communities. In the years of the pilot, we have 30 operational learning communities which show very much the scalability of, of the model and um, we actually established a micro to macro process moving from uh, connecting resource to activities to cross campus and so on. So from the start, we could pilot how we could really bring and build innovation, which is, in my view, one of the most abused terms uh, when, it, when we talk about pedagogical development. But anyway, I'm not going to sidetrack on that. But to really enhance on and reach what we do on the basis of existing practice. And this is is to me something that if we talk about those things is fundamental because what we all have in our universities is wonderful products, uh, inverted commas, wonderful schemes, a lot of experience, enormous attempts to resolve everything we're talking about is not new. What we don't have is the system that would enable us to work together in terms of providing opportunities in different ways to what we do. We don't have the relationships because uh, unlike research where we know how to research internationally, uh, everybody agrees that research should be international. Research councils have been much more tuned in and support and so on. Education is very much uh, national in the focus. Uh, we have national regulators it's related to social, uh, to, to sort of the kind of political issues and we heard about that. So establishing strong relationships in educational collaboration to me is fundamental. So connecting teachers, connecting students, connecting non-academic partners is very important for achieving these multiple mobilities, but is also fundamental in thinking about our role, our relationship and our relevance to the world around us. So um, we also established connected research communities and in Utopia More we have the ambition or the aspiration to have connected communities that actually will bring uh, learning and teaching and research together. But the actual process and of course this then gives us the springboard to think of joint degrees, to think of new provision, but doing this on the basis of building first on what we do well and what we already have. That's the Utopia. Jan, may I make mm -hmm. a remark? Please, yes. Because yeah. I think this could also be extended to the civic society that you mentioned. I mean, deeper collaborations could also benefit uh, a bigger society where we could have many more reach out activities. Uh, and I think that could link to your issue on democracy. I mean, uh, people, we have so much um, to provide uh, broadly and, and connecting uh, more across universities could, could uh, make international exposure even better. Mm -hmm. I, I, have, I have tons of um, questions, but can I first of all ask in the audience, is, are, are there any questions from the audience at this stage or any, anybody wishes to share some of their experience of, of new rethinking about mobility, new types, new models, <clears throat> challenges? Yes, please. I see you from the back, but you have your hand up.
Yeah, um, hello again. <laughs> My name is Katharina Schmidt. I'm from TU Dresden, um, and we just met briefly. But um, um, I'm wondering, you know, especially when you're at conferences like this or others, and there are all these wonderful ideas out, and some of them really work. And especially if there's a consortium behind it, they go ahead. But there are so many who are not part of consortia, or yeah. So what do we really need? to make this happen for the majority so that we're not creating more segregation and more difference in chances and do we need like a new Bologna yeah is 2029 going to be like the second big thing where we need something like that um, and not just on a European level or how are we going to get there Anybody uh, in the panel? Yeah, an easy question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it's a little bit, uh, I don't know whether you were here in the previous session, but it's a little bit following my problem of that we are inventing in all our networks and in all our countries, we are inventing the questions of how to digitally, because really the digital tools are the ones, if we want to spread a practice to the wide audience, currently, in our current world, it has to be digitally supported. And, and, and we are inventing the tools in all our networks, in all our countries. And this is something I think the new Bologna could think about. What are the sort of tools? And I was just hearing during the break uh, an initiative in the German region to provide, to make the uh, study materials available publicly, university level. Wonderful idea. I mean, it's, it's not a very crazy new idea, but it's, a, it's a just something that has to be done in order to, to make these kind of initiatives publicly available and, and, and used by, by different universities, but also by the, by the wide audience. Uh, so these kind of digitally enabled tools uh, that would support this uh, widening of the, of the mobilities, but also different uh, uh, resources that the universities have. Thank you. This is such a rich question. Other, other, um, other, other colleagues. Could I just follow up really briefly? Because one of the big questions I think we've been also thinking about over these past days is, is, is this actually going to happen? Because it has so much to do with power difference and financial means and what comes in through universities as businesses and through systems that we've built for centuries. Um, are we going to give all of that up so that we can actually make it equal? I, what's the struggle going to be like? I'm, I'm just... Uh, I'd be happy if we do. <laughs> yeah. No, but you're absolutely right. I mean, uh, having the access, I mean, having the material doesn't mean everybody has equal access to it. So that is something that we definitely need to think about. But to reverse it a little bit, I mean, this is the first time in history, in human history, that so many young people have access to higher education. So you're right, there is still a lot to be desired, but it's a huge step forward. You know, uh, if we think about the very elitist uh, role that um, universities played in the past, this is an immense opening. And just to see, you know, to be aware uh, what the Americans um, term uh, underserved, but not undeserving. So which parts of the population would actually profit or gain or, you know, be, have a better life uh, if they had access uh, to the university, but we do not reach them yet. I mean, just to ask that question, uh, to have that in our horizon, I think is a huge step um, distinguishing it from the past. Uh, I mean, the present university from the past. So. I would like to, to, to give, provide an example of how it's already used. Our university <coughs> stream uh, lectures in natural sciences to uh, several hundred thousand people spread from Nuke in Greenland uh, all over the country. People move, meet in movie theaters, houses, uh, and, and it's, it's high level uh, lectures, but provided for, for, for civil society. And that could not be done without the digitalization. And, and especially the collaboration with movie theaters has turned out to be a very, very uh, good way to spread uh, knowledge uh, and, and, and even set up communities who, who uh, I have been really impressed about the level that is possible. Don't underestimate people's interest and intelligence. 
Jo? Yeah, and if I may, just on that is uh, on the on the positive. We do have a long way to go, but a lot has been achieved, and I think it's actually because of where we are and because of all those, we can really work with policymakers to uh, to to lobby and to break some of those boundaries and to have a different relationship between uh, the universities, the regulators, the commission, with the uh, networks we are part of. These are really very powerful. So if we actually see the, net, the reach of the guild, uh, what the reach of the European University Alliances we are referring to, there is a lot we can do. And I think now we are in a very good position where we know what we, what we can do. We've tried, we have a lot of attempts of of uh, things we didn't work in the past, and we have seen also some very good practices that we want to move from a periphery to mainstream. So we can hold uh, all these other bodies that actually are, have signed up and have the same commitment accountable to really continue opening spaces, continue bringing together and continue asking the question. I think a lot has been achieved and we can build on it. But I think there's sort of also, we have to engage more and ask difficult questions about the funding and the business model. And it is something that we often don't do for very good reasons, and we shouldn't do it for every part of the conversation. But we also know that everywhere I go, the challenges are the same. Uh, energy costs going up, provosts tightening the belt, uh, universities need to balance and do more with uh, com competing for resource globally. If I close my eyes and I don't know where I am, I hear exactly the same conversation, exactly the same. The couleur locale is different, but the issues are exactly exactly the same. So we also need to translate and engage more with the translation of what is it that we need to make this happen? How, with our existing tools, how far can our existing tools take us? And have a sort of open conversation about the fact that if we need a different funding model, a different model, this needs to happen and it needs to happen much more seriously in terms of actually really thinking pragmatically if we were to think, okay, what we want to see being done differently in the next five years, in the context where we all know how long things take and so on, mm. how can we actually get there? And I think we have an opportunity now to do it. Mm -hmm. A little bit on the um, yeah. Barry, can, can I just raise a, 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 an issue that's that's related to the, the changes in higher education that we see, because it seems to me one of the really, really important um, uh, things to 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 have emerged uh, much more clearly than ever before is the whole well-being agenda. That that I think we are much more conscious of the need to support uh, students in this, uh, and and a, a much greater consciousness of the diversity of our student body. How do we integrate that perspective better into into our this discussion around mobility? A difficult uh, question, but I think at least we must acknowledge that during the pandemic, the, the, the ones that suffered most were the young generation. Uh, and we are returning to uh, what I will call a new uh, normality. Uh, we, we must deal with the more uh, young people come being lo feeling lonely, uh, insufficient, uh, uh, and, and having anxiety, and we somehow need uh, uh, to, 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 to acknowledge how, how can we create, I think, what also what we are doing among us, uh, new kinds of, of, of communities. Uh, uh, and, and one problem now is that, that part of what is uh, said to be the course was that they had to be taught online. So we have to give up and try to also see the, the, the possibilities. And one possibility that I see, but I, I'm eager to discuss that with you, the rest of you, is maybe, again, can we have teachers engage more uh, in the well-being of students, both at home, and, and uh, you already talked about the journey, uh, kind about building uh, with ref reference to Dewey, uh, that you cannot take this mobility as an isolated uh, issue. But, but I have no clear answers to, to this, but, but at least I think we have to talk about a new normal. We will never return, at least that's what I see at my home university, to the time exactly as it was before. 
Um, I think there was a question to the panel, so. Yeah, I very much agree, uh, Barrett, absolutely. And uh, I, I think that uh, there are tools, there are also digital tools that we should utilize much more, and these are collaborative. You know, I think whenever students have um, or have the experience of doing something together, it takes a little bit the pressure off. Mm -hmm. And uh, this has maybe also to do with the deeper question of, is our main focus achievement and measuring achievement? Mm -hmm. Or should we also say, no, I mean, as institutions of higher education who are proud to be strong in research, and research is also about failing. Mm -hmm. I mean, how many experiments go wrong mm -hmm. before something goes right? Mm -hmm. And so we have to have this, this kind of, you know, this curiosity with the possibility of maybe not being successful at the first shot, uh, build more into our institutional culture and encourage our students mm -hmm. and give them maybe a, a better support structure. Because that's exactly, as, as Barrett said, that's the big lesson to be learned uh, from the COVID crisis, is that terrible feeling of isolation and, and loneliness uh, students had. And uh, this should be, you know, a very clear call uh, of awakening to us to, uh, as institutions, you know, what can we do to provide a better environment? Can I just add to that? That's, that's so important, the better environment, what it is. And what I find uh, often sort of catching myself really sort of in this sort of big tension is that we talk about the student, and this is a whole separate issue about how much we actually are really student-centered when we talk about opportunity and development and how much our students and their voice is really part of this co-creation. But we're talking about, and we take for granted resilience, and we're taking for granted mental health, uh, well-being, and strategies in place, and students who can cope with uh, the type of educational experiences that would require them to spend uh, six months Warwick, uh, six months to begin uh, back at Warwick, uh, then back to begin, and then go somewhere global, and so on. These are not the students I see in many times when I work with my students, when I work with students in other institutions, when I work with students in other institutions across the world. So there are issues that have been exacerbated that actually something like this would be detrimental. We would have students dropping out, we would have uh, add, us adding onto the anxiety, us adding on, uh, on, on sort of conditions that are there. It takes time for our students to settle in and, and so on. So we often talk also having a sort of probably different generation of student in mind, which sometimes is makes me think, is it that we come together and we design and, and sort of the engagement with the student is not as deep as, as, as it should be? Because what does opportunity mean for whom is fundamental? Yeah, and can I just, when you say supportive structures, I, I think it's important to warn this is not psychological uh, support. I think if we look to the North America, there are, I just heard recently, more and more psychologists is uh, uh, this at the same time the, 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 the degree of uh, not feeling well is increasing. So it's not providing each person with their own psychologist. On the contrary, it's meaningful engagement. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if I just wanted very shortly to come in, we just had our uh, University Alliance meeting and we were talking about the support uh, uh, the universities have been providing to the students during the COVID time. And every university we were speaking said they hired more psychologists. Uh, and it was like 3,000, uh, 7,000 students per one psychologist uh, in, in our universities. Uh, and but, but everybody was saying also that the students actually discovered or said by themselves that it's not so much about reacting afterwards, but rather providing, I mean, preventive measures and getting stu students back together. And that's exactly about, it's also very much the question for the mobile students also, who, who, who often we feel at least isolated from the local students. They maybe sort of talk to other, other, um, other mobile students. And, um, uh, and that's exactly, I mean, it's not just a question of mobility, but it's a question also about the, whether students are staying, I mean, physically in campus or they are studying virtually. And we just heard about the concept of sticky campus, <laughs> which uh, to bring the students back to campus and to 
put them to create the spaces so they could talk to each other because if that's the best sort of psychological help that the students can do to to talk to each other <laughs> Can I just, uh, we, we only have a few minutes left, but can I just raise one final question, which is really, I mean, w you've talked very much around uh, ab about, you know, issues of, of, of experimentation, of flexibility, thinking things through in a new way, but connecting it to, uh, to of course, the experience of students. Um, uh, and so that creates a question, I think, around um, structure. Um, and um, maybe to, to make this most concrete, um, the European Commission, as you know, is now uh, really interested in this question around a European degree. Uh, and Arno, you mentioned, in fact, that we had a very old conventional way of, of uh, one of those three ways was really about thinking about joint degrees. So, so as we think about a European degree, should this really be something akin to a kind of um, labour for a joint degree? Or, or what, what should this be in your view? How would you relate this idea of a European degree to the kinds of things that you've been talking about? Just if, if I can start, it's... Um, um yeah, that's uh, if I promise that by the end of this <laughs> discussion we are, we, are, we are trying to to show some light of some solutions also then then from my point of view I see the solution in uh, what I call semi-joint degrees. So instead of uh, really demanding a European degree with the very tight uh, integration between and so in the planned way that you have to spend, uh, I don't know, four semesters in uh, four different universities in order to get a European degree. And finally, you have this bureau I'm bureaucratic in a sense that uh, that we have been interviewing uh, the joint degree uh, program managers in our universities and also elsewhere and asking whether there is a benefit of this European degree. And the general answer is that that the university academics don't see the benefit, the students at least in Europe don't see the benefit and the employers don't see the benefit. The may, maybe the outside of Europe, Europe the, the students who are coming from uh, outside of Europe, they see the value of the European label on the degree. But, but instead of this kind of organization, which is very expensive, it's very, it can be done with a, with a very high quality and if it's supported with Erasmus Mundus money, it can be organized with a high scholarships, very good students and the students who want to have this kind of and who are ready for that and whose mental health, <laughs> who are mentally happy of, uh, of moving from one uh, country to another and having, uh, who see this as an opportunity to, to also engage in the different labour markets and to see the different labour markets. But, but that's really, we see that it's a very, very limited number of students currently available. But instead of that, to have this kind of semi-joint degrees, and that's the, 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 what I imagine is that we have like four universities here. We, all of us have the degree in mathematics, let's say, uh, or program in mathematics. And uh, during one semester, uh, we have built in mobility for one branch or one specialization or one group of students. And they know from the beginning that during the third semester they would go, if they would study some specific aspect of mathematics, they would go to Aarhus semester, but they still go back and, and they would spend there where once and, and, and graduate in Tartu. So it's, uh, uh, and that would be, uh, I mean, built-in mobility, uh, sort of joint degree, and, uh, and, and students who want to, uh, to have, and that's a professionally also interesting because I think then they, we could enlarge our program without, uh, I mean, doing anything very much extra and they could just provide something uh, that they would do anyway very well. So that's my sort of way out of this mess in a way that we see currently with these mobilities and joint curricula and, and rather, rather limited opportunities uh, on, the, on the one hand and the big ambitions on the other hand. Can I ask your three colleagues maybe for a final reflection on this issue, one one minute each, if possible? Uh, yeah, I think that uh, Aune is, is very right, you know, in pointing out this way to the semi-joint degree. I think that's a very good way um, to to have like common activities without overburdening uh, the, the students and the administration and everybody involved. Um, another uh, model could be um, to emphasize the complementarity of uh, our systems. So, for example, by 
Sometimes it's good to get out of a rut by going somewhere else. You know, if you if you think you're kind of stuck at the place you are, then it might be definitely a good idea to get a different perspective. So when I talked about continuity, uh, this does not mean that sometimes a disruption can be a positive impulse. So I think we need to systematize all these various approaches um, and uh, then come up n not maybe with one model, but with you know various uses, so to speak, of the um, European um, degree. I, I can continue exactly in that. This is very much in the spirit of uh, also what we try to pilot uh, in, in in a utopia, but also more broadly. What I see as a sort of way forward is that um, embedding a diversity of learning experience and opportunities is very important and instead of having a one size fits all really work also take the opportunity to work with the commission and i think that this is really a time to, to do that uh, to think how we can actually uh, have the various policy tools on the table so that uh, they uh, aiming towards a European degree or joint provision that is scalable uh, is actually there, but is actually not only this, it's not the only pathway, but we have different pathways that enable students to experience global education from the start in different ways. So start early, start small, start diverse, as, as early as possible, so we can actually provide opportunity to as many students as possible, embed that and interface that in the policy that we already have in our our current institutions so make it sustainable because what we everybody in this room will have seen is what I often call educational fireworks something fantastic that produces a firework and then poof uh, that sort of it's never realizes its full potential so diversity of learning experiences embedded and in interaction with existing tools that we already have in our institutions, work with the policymakers for these tools to be very much part of the toolkit. So it's not only one label or a label for one type of a key, like a joint degree, but it's actually very much of a developmental process of connectedness. Uh, and then through that, very much take a role of a facilitator role uh, to actually would uh, support and guide students to engage with that which then would have the connectivity and the coherence we need. So that would be my take. Yeah, and... Thank you, and Barrett? And I, I'm... I, when I hear European degree, I hear bureaucracy. Uh, and so there's mo not much support for that idea in, in, in Denmark. Um, also, I think universities have to be careful not to be on that cross-pressure between the Commission and, and the national governments. but. To, 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 to go in a more positive way, I wish that we could again see the teachers, also the mobility we have seen between university teachers as a way forward. I, I could wish that teachers were much more engaged also in peer review of, of, of uh, learning, uh, as you said, with mathematics in, in two different of four different universities. How, how do we uh, engage and, and uh, learn that so up? I mean, that's the, at the core of our research collaboration. Could we somehow stimulate that and, and then maybe at some point in the future we would have the foundation for, for some European, maybe not degree, but maybe some labeling or something. That would be my wish for the future. We could uh, continue to talk for hours. There's so many points that you mentioned. Uh, you all kept phenomenally to the time, so, we have, so I'm trying, going to try and sum this up with, in one minute. But uh, um, we've covered a huge uh, range uh, in this panel today. But I think what really comes across is is the the excitement the, the, that we are really at an exciting moment. Um, I want to go back to the question of Bologna 2029 or whenever. And I think you've you've given us a lot of um, tools, a lot of things to think about about how we, we can genuinely think about new um, mobility in a new way. And I think the key words or the key notions, I think, that are really in my mind from, from what you've discussed is the, the important moment that we're at about the de democratic moment of higher education, both in the, in, this, in the student body that we have, in the capacity and the opportunity to go beyond our campuses into wider society, also through our teaching, 
um, and the, the the democracy the, the democratization is also inherent in the the uh, the experience that we can provide in the uh, in, in in and through mobility um, and in making sure that this is not an exclu uh, exclusive or uh, excluding experience within our universities within our European universities but also beyond the European universities I think that was a really uh, important uh, point um, I just want to uh, maybe end with an appeal I think it's really important Joe as you said that, that we work with uh, policymakers at in the European Commission but it's clearly important also to work with policymakers at the national level so that as Barrett as you said this is not seen as a conflict but that maybe in, in going back Karin to your your points about why mobility is really important that policymakers at all levels see the huge huge value that we that we can gain from exposing students from 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 challenging students uh, uh, through different uh, types of of mobility and that this will have all kinds of benefits uh, not just to the wide economy or culture but to the to the students themselves and for their future life journeys I just want to really thank the panel for for coming to Berlin. For, I want to thank your panel for your phenomenal contributions, and I really want to thank you most of all um, for continuing to inspire me. I mean, I'm sure that everybody in the audience has felt this as well. It's been a, a real pleasure to listen to you, and and um, your arguments will keep challenging me, and I will keep thinking about what you've said, and I'm sure others will too. Thank you so much. It's been a fantastic hour. Thank you.